called me, uh, I think it was a Wednesday night, and he was like, hey, um, how do you feel about driving a van from Boston to Nashville for Saturday? Jesus. And I was like, when do you need me to leave? He's like, well, ideally as soon as possible. <laughs> I was like, all right. So I woke up the next day, drove down to Boston, grabbed the van, drove out to Nashville, uh, made it by Friday night, which was sick. Damn. And then uh, flew home. So I'm not, stra- not a stranger to, to making long drives. So oh, I appreciate this you was... added one more to the calendar for us. <laughs> yeah, th- this, uh, was, uh, this was an easy drive. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I'll go ahead and slide this just a little bit closer to you. Uh, just to, yeah, get even better. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Episode 39, Evan Middleton. Dude, we got vocals in sync with me. We got photo, video, content. We're going to get into it all. <laughs> uh, before we dive into all the episode stuff, uh, anything to plug up top? Any shows coming up? Music we got that just came out? Anything we want to tell the universe yep. about? Uh, so we did just drop a new single called Fall From Grace. Hell it yeah. is coming off of a three-song EP that we recorded with uh, Cameron Mizell. Hell yeah. Uh, most notably doing like Sleeping With Sirens, Memphis Mayfire. One My of personal names. favorite of Machines. Yep. Uh, I bugged the shit out of him about like the time when he recorded that album That's with cool. them. I had to know like <laughs> everything I, that he could tell me. Yep. Um, but we released that last month with a video that I actually shot myself mm-hmm. for us, um, which is a pain in the ass. I hate shooting our I've videos. I've done it myself. Yep. yep, yep, yep. Um, and then we do have one show so far confirmed for the rest of this year, which okay. is November 4th in Claremont, New Hampshire at Healy's Carpet. Yeah. I get, I've never played there. I've never been up there. Okay. Um, I know it's kind of like in uh, nowhere, New Hampshire. It's like it's like pretty up. This is there. the carpet store. Yes. Fuck. It's, someone it's was a, just sitting here telling me about this, and it's gonna drive me nuts <laughs> trying to figure out who the hell, what band it was. But it's in some of the clips in one of the episodes. Someone just when they're playing a carpet store, and I remember sitting here being like, "I need to know more about this place. What the hell is happening in the carpet I, store?" I guess it's literally just a car, like a regular yep. carpet store yep. that also puts on metal shows, like from That's time to time. I, I, I don't think yeah. it's like a. A regular thing, like they're not doing it all the time, mm-hmm. but I do know I, I like there are a certain group of local bands that are up in that area yeah. that I see put shows on there. That and then so cool. when uh, Jake from Void Bear hit us up and was like, Hey, I'd love to have sync with me on this, we were like, Yo, let's fucking do it because so it's, it's also a Halloween show, so we're gonna dress up in some crazy costumes and we're gonna rip some old songs that we don't play that's, normally because it's gonna to just it. be a fun night. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Let's start with uh, shooting the music video for yourself. So I've done it uh, in this very basement a couple times where when I was uh, first getting into shooting music videos, uh, for context also for people listening, I'm realizing one that we don't know each other too well, which is kind of a fun, a fun setup <laughs> to get to dive into the bottom and learn more about each other here. Uh, but for context, yeah, I started shooting videos in like 2016, 2017-ish. Uh, and then somewhere like 2020, it was like, okay, I think I'm good enough to do this more often but how the fuck do you find clients? How do you find people to do the thing for? Uh, so my answer there was like, well, I'm going to make a song with my friends. We're going to film the video of us and that'll be my, my pitch to other people. Uh, so I did it and you're right. It's hard as hell. And it's so hard to like remove yourself from the process and also be involved with it. Yeah. What was your experience like working on that video? So th- this last video, I would say out of all the videos I've done for us, cause mm-hmm. I've done four of them at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say this one was the easiest just because I have, I have more experience. Yeah. Um, I knew exactly kind of what I wanted to go for lighting and like how I wanted the whole video to play out. Where so, were you? Where's the location for that? Like, I don't the know location is just our drummer's living room. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was just, um, he had this nice, uh, lawnmower. There we go. Uh, <laughs> he had this nice like window pane that looked great when the light came in and it gave this like mm-hmm. really soft, like halogen effect. Yep. Um, with, with some stuff that I added as an overlay. Of course. Yeah. It looked gorgeous. Um, so... We, yeah, we did that, and we just put, like, a bunch of plants around, and it was pretty much supposed to be just, like, a dreamy, hazy vibe mm-hmm. for the song. I th- and I think it came out really well. I liked doing that um, more than the, the previous ones I've done. It came out <laughs> great. Uh, I'm Fred, but you have volume here, by the way, if you want it in your headphones, up or down, whatever. Whatever feels great to you. Oh, um, that is, that there is we nice. Go. Yes. Um, what was my, oh, was this living room something you've been, like, looking at for a while, being like, we're going to film here eventually? Or was it, like, a drummer said, hey, we have a space, and you said, all right, we can make that work? Yeah, that's pretty much yeah. it. Um, I believe we were looking at a peer space option and um, the day of or like a couple of days before they like were like, no, we don't allow live drums. So then we were like, oh, well, you know, we all planned for this day to have off. And then Dakota was like, check it out. I have, you know, my living room. Yep. So we went and 
just like looked at it day of because like it was either going to be in that corner of his living room or potentially in another spot. And I was like, no, nah, we're just going to shoot it all right there. That's, yeah. That's perfect. It worked out. Yeah. And like the, you're right. The white like shears over the wall, whatever the hell you call those things, the clearish curtains worked as like a white background. And I like the like the kind of B angle there. I guess you call it. I don't even know what you would call it that worked out. So yeah. You got the white background and the context of the house and it worked to get yeah, a couple different looks out of one living room there. Yeah, I, re- I really <laughs> liked that one. The, the oh, other yeah. ones were a little bit of a struggle when well, I was first learning. Like, uh, the yeah. first video I did for us was for our song, um, Obsessed. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about frame rates and um, the timeline sequence, none of mm-hmm. that. So when I put it up, it looks like a Spanish soap opera. <laughs> you know what I'm talking <laughs> that about? Smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yep. it's awful. That was like the biggest comment was just like, why is this export in 60 FPS? That's so funny, <laughs> dude. I have a, like a vivid memory of being like 12 years old. And my friend had like, I think it's called The Other Guys, that like the, the cop movie back yep. in the day, the comedy cop movie. Uh, and I remember watching it on like his brand new TV and being so confused of like, why does this look crazy? And it's when I was eight, 10 years later, it's like, oh, they must have just somehow, I must have watched it at 60 frames. That's the only thing that makes sense of like, it, I, it was like right when Blue ever, Blu-ray was popular. Uh, so in hindsight, it's like, yeah, maybe. That's the only thing that can make any sense to me is for some reason I had some version of it. Uh, but yeah, that 60 frames is always one of those like layers of math that's so subtle to everything we do. And I've been recently trying to teach someone more of the video stuff and kind of share more. And as I try and teach it more, it becomes more obvious of like, fuck, there is so much math that goes into this and so many numbers you got to be aware of and all the ratios of, yeah, the shutter to the frame rate and all these little things that go into it that are like they're intuitive to us, but so important to teach and so easy to fuck up and ruin a whole project with up front. Uh, I've definitely done it. Yeah. With uh, having the frame rate too high and getting the, the, what's it called? The strobing in the lights, uh, the, what are those bars called in the lights? When you have the pitch uh, frame rate up too high. Um, oh, I know what you're talking about. It's like the, the, like the yes. lens, uh, they, there's a name for that. I'm drawing a blank on the word. I can't um, think of it, but I know exactly what you're exactly talking what about. Because I've done it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that what was coming wrong in the first couple of videos with your band? Like you mentioned, the first few were tough. And you, it was number stuff. It was camera well, stuff. So, all right. So when I first started doing the video stuff mm-hmm. and now knowing what I know now, yeah. I did everything so ass backwards. Of course. Like in yep. terms of how I was building my videos. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until... Um, on a tour that I was on that I met Brian from Mirror Lake, their drummer, and he showed me how he does a music video and like mm-hmm. how he sets up his timeline and all the stuff he does. And you know, he was showing me that he'll import all his clips, he color codes them, and then he goes through each take and like cuts up the sections that he's like, Yeah, I like the way that looked. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, I've never done it this way. I like the way I did it before was just so bad. Yep. And then recently, um, was the first chance I got to use that method was on a video that wasn't mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a video for Gina, mm-hmm. and I got to like test that yep. that method, set everything up, cut through everything, and it helped that they're really good at what they do. Yep. Um, and it came out amazing. Like I, I just I wish I had known then <laughs> what I know now, but yep. I guess that's all a part of the process. And it is the experience. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. I I still struggle with that. Where like watching footage back is such an important part of the process that is so tedious and mind numbing at times. Of like, yeah, we, now we have ten takes of the song, and the idea of going through each one of them and scrubbing through and then starting to work uh, is always a tough like thing to wrap my head around. I'm like, no, I just want to start now. I just want to get into and get into the flow and get into the rhythm. Uh, and it's like, no, you're right. The better method there is to go slow and steady and piece through it from the beginning and then know where the garbage is and have a sense of where the, the big building blocks are that you want to build around. Exactly. And through. Uh, hell yeah, dude. Uh, how does it compare working on your like videos for your own band versus other stuff? So I guess, uh, this is going to be a better place to hear is where does this all start for you? Uh, so I'm wondering like when you have an idea, it seems like it'd be tough for me, all my ideas go into clients, right? It's a one, well, I, all my ideas, if it's a good idea, any idea I like that I save ends up in a client thing. I think if I had my own band, it'd be really tough to separate where the ideas go and what ends up in what pile. Uh, is that a challenging thing for you? How are you, yeah, dealing out ideas there? I guess, I guess it depends on, cause like most of the time, so far, mm-hmm. um, most of the clients have brought their ideas. So mm-hmm. I'm, you know, working off what they're bringing to the table and then kind of putting my own uh, twist or perspective on it. Yeah. Um, and there are a few ideas I would like to do. Uh, it just hasn't fit for any of the bands that I've, that have hit me up to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the stuff for my own band is a little out of budget for what I'm able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I, I guess it hasn't been too difficult to, to kind of go between the two mm-hmm. in terms of whether or not using my ideas. But like a lot of the ideas that I come up with for like our stuff are like very um, story driven and direct with mm-hmm. like what the song and the lyrics are about. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's not tangible in the sense that I could just be like, oh, I'm going to take this idea and put it over here. I assume it's also a lot easier to take risks with sync with me stuff when it's your own stuff and there isn't someone else to please. It's a lot more of like, no, this is us. This is my vision that we can see out without me to worry about another party being also satisfied with it. Yeah. 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 I, I would say, and that's been one of the, the biggest benefits of like everything we do is pretty much DIY with mm-hmm. the exception of our recording. So all the graphics are we, me and Apollo do ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, all our shirt designs, like all our social media stuff is all us. Um, and so with the videos doing them ourselves, we have had that, like, this is exactly what we wanted. Yep. You know, we didn't have to like hope like, oh man, I really hope this dude nails our vision. Mm -hmm. Granted, uh, we worked with Ian on two videos and he absolutely fucking crushed it. Like exceeded our expectations for what we were going for. Um, so we, we've had some good luck go outsourcing and I think we do want to outsource some more just because again, we're we're kind of limited on what we're able to do because like not mm-hmm. everybody in my band is proficient with a camera. So I can't, you know, be like, hey, dude, can you operate my gimbal yes. and can you get these shots of me? You mm-hmm. know, it just it doesn't really work that way with them. Are you doing most of it on a tripod then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we do a lot of tripod mm-hmm. shots. Um, I would love to do gimbal just because I feel like there's just so much more um, life in the Lots footage. Like, yeah. yes, yep. character. Perfect word for it. Um but when not everyone's super proficient with it and I don't really have the time to yeah. teach them, it's better to just set up the tripod and go like For sure. simplistic. And have the handheld later. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've been impressed in the past when I've had band guys operate a gimbal. And my, my logic has always been that like I think band guys are generally better at photography than a lot of other people because they've been in so many photos and they've consumed so many that when the camera is now in their hands, they have a better sense of like what will make the other person happy or sad kind of because they've felt that so many times. Uh, and I think with a the gimbal, there's a similar thing of like, we've watched so many music videos that like, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be rough, but I think they would do a lot better with it than other people. And I've been impressed in the past of like someone just picking up my gimbal and making it work in that exact scenario of like, I need this. Can you just try it? And it's like, actually you figured it out pretty well. And of course that's because we tuned the gimbal. It's all set up and we, got it set up for success there. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how that would go if you were able to make that happen. I, I would like to try it. We yeah. we did do some uh, for one video mm-hmm. where I did all handheld um, and went a little crazy. The, the biggest critique I got on that was how shaky cam it was. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did have uh, Apollo film me for one of them and it, it wasn't too bad. Some of them were just, it's just like little things that he didn't know about like mm-hmm. what I was seeing for the video. So it's like, yeah everyone else's takes were the way that I wanted them. And then like, I still had like a lot of good takes of what I did. He did a good job. Of course. It's just like, there were some shots that were like unusable because either he didn't back up when I came forward mm-hmm. or vice versa. And it just like, he falls you know, some shots to are a like, like here. Yeah. <laughs> you said stand here and he stood yeah, there, yeah, but he exactly. needed, yeah, he needed a, a I don't know, a Take more a experience back. take yeah, <laughs> to understand that. Uh, definitely handheld would be the most difficult there to me of like handheld feels like the most, challenging to get right it takes the most expertise in my brain to like have it be uh, a good level of energy and not shaky like there's a really weird line there between like creative movement that's controlled and chaotic and just handheld shaky bad movement yeah you definitely like like i have recently like on tour i stopped using my gimbal Mm -hmm. um with the exception of like a really massive venue that's just like it's so big. I, I will want to get those cool shots. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I'm just using my gimbal and I'll like sit there when I find like the shot I want to get and I'll like buckle my arms up mm-hmm. and I'll move mad slow so I can yep. get the gimbal effect. Yep. But it's not. And uh, it's worked out pretty good. The The last couple of recaps I posted have no gimbal in them. Hell so yeah. I feel it, so much easier in the context of a venue, not having to worry about all of this gear and the balance. And I feel like the gimbal prohibits me from finding kind of creative like niche angles it's great for like the big wide stuff but yeah it prohibits me from reaching my camera around and going hey what if what if like just it it almost feels like you have kind of just like this is the set range of motion that i'm able to capture Mm -hmm. whereas with handheld i've been able to get uh like a little bit more crazy with some Mm -hmm. of this stuff or like if i see something opportune in the moment i don't have to like flip my gimbal turn it and go i can just 
Mm-hmm. There it is. It's the way. Yeah. And shooting blind is half of our job, right? Like it's, it's very rare that you get to look through the camera as you're operating. It feels like at a concert that you're always trying to reach out and shoot from outside your head. And the gimbal, yeah, also makes that harder because you can't hold it as far as heavy. Like it stinks to, to reach around with. Yes. Um, <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning. So where does this whole thing start for you? So we've chatted about the, there's music stuff going on. There's photo video, there's graphic design stuff going on. Like, I guess, well, yeah, what comes first? The chicken or the egg and all this stuff? <laughs> um, so I'd say the first thing would, it would be music. That That's what mm-hmm. I started with. Okay. Um, I, I got into the heavier side of music. So like growing up, I was listening to like Britney Spears and saying Backstreet Boys, yep. um, Creed and into Lincoln Park, of course. Um, mm-hmm. And then I remember my friend showed me Disturbed one time. And I think it was 10th or Down With The Sickness, maybe. And I was just like, dude, this sucks. This is not good. I don't like it. And he's like, nah, dude, you, you know, <laughs> let it grow on you. And I listened to that for a bit. And then actually, it's really funny because I might not. I If it weren't for a kid on Xbox Live, I might not have ever gotten into metalcore and like this whole genre yep um i was playing like back in the day halo 3 forge incredible i was playing that with a like a a lobby of people and Mm -hmm. like we were talking about bands and i'm like yeah do you listen to lincoln park and disturb it's like you ever listen to the devil wears prada i was like the movie and he's like nah the band i was like no i have he's like listen to dogs can grow beards all over i was like okay and i looked it up and i was like wow this really sucks like i don't like this and he's like nah dude listen to it like a hundred times you'll love it and I did do that. And then after that, it just, it stemmed. It just, that's funny. I was into the, the world just of some screaming random guy. music. Yeah. Just some random dude on Xbox. Like, I like the idea that it was like the bassist from Prada, just like trying to like distribute his band's music. It just, it could have been, who switches. knows, <laughs> but that, that was like the defining moment for me that I remember like that's actually funny. really getting into this music for the first time. And then, um, how old are you at this time? Like <sighs> middle school, early high school ish. I think I was 16 okay. at the time. Somewhere in high 16, school. 16, 17. Yep. Yeah, definitely in high school. Um, and then I went to my like first show, uh, which was Asking Alexandria, Born of Osiris, and I want to say The Plot in You. I could be wrong on that. Okay. I don't remember the entire tour package, but I remember being in the crowd and like feeling the energy and like everything i went wow like you know Mm -hmm. i want to i want to try that sometime so then i went home and like uh at my mom's house we had like this uh basement and we had this like off room that we called like the bat cave that just had like old vinyl records and stuff and like Mm -hmm. tools and i used to just go down there with like a fake uh or unplugged microphone and i would just practice all day and then i started doing like youtube covers yep um, and my YouTube channel name was bring Evan the horizon. <laughs> um, I used to get oh, these kids that found it. Cause like I used to work at a local restaurant. They would like come in and leave cards and say, Oh no, it's bring Evan the horizon. Like <laughs> That's goofing with me. Like the worst thing. Yeah, it is. Could ever I was happen. like, Oh my God. Yep. And then, um, I, I had a couple successful covers on there. Mm-hmm. Like get some numbers. I did a sleeping with sirens one that was terrible out of tune. And mm-hmm. that one got a lot of hate. I, I hid that one for sure. That'll <laughs> never see the light of day again. Um, but that, that's what I did for a while. And then, um, I started like my very, very first band limits mm-hmm. and did that for a little bit. Uh, I got kicked out of that by someone that joined and like took over and then they disbanded. Um, um uh, <laughs> I would love to hear that story. I'm also not going to press you to say it into a microphone because it sounds like there, yeah, some stuff. And I never want to pry and put people in position on microphone. Uh, but I'm also fascinated how you get kicked out of a band that you started. It's, but we can also move on if that's was, a more comfortable solution here. No, I, I can talk about it. It's not a big deal. It's okay. like, so when back then I was like very inexperienced, mm-hmm. like I was very new to it all. Like the, my lyrics showed that, like delivery showed that. Um, and for the person who like, came into the band and became like the main writer Mm -hmm. of the music. I just wasn't, um, gotcha far enough along in terms of being a front man for his standards. And then like the rest of the band agreed. So they were all just like, you know, pretty much we're going to take the band and push you out. And they ended up getting someone else. I think they played one show and then they disbanded because nobody Mm -hmm. wanted to support them because they kicked me out. (laughs) Um, then I did dismissed, which was like, I guess my, bigger project Uh um didn't really like do too much we just played some shows and stuff and then 
uh, after that, I had like a really sour taste in my mouth for music, and I, like, Absolutely. I wanted nothing to do with it. I was just very done, you know, uh, very drained. Um, and it was actually, it was the first summer of COVID. I was actually here in Connecticut uh, doing storm work when I was a uh, line clearance technician. Okay. Um, and I had a buddy uh, call me, and he's like, yo, dude, uh, check out this song. And I, like, listened to it, and it was my song, like a song we, that my band Dismissed hadn't released like an unreleased song that someone took and uploaded like with my vocals mm -hmm. as like their own new band. <laughs> like someone took That's all of so our absurd. took all of our songs and put it online under his own new project. Came out with a backstory for like the it was I think he called it like the depression sessions or something and like was like talking about all the hurt and trauma it. he had been through like why he wrote it. And I was like what the fuck dude you didn't write any of this. And so we, we, we found his Twitter and on that, like tw his Twitter, he was like sad posting for mm -hmm. like girls and stuff, talking about how deep he is with yeah, like yeah, the yeah. music the cool and everything. Stuff. And, um, it was at that point in time, we like, you know, we called him out and like a bunch of our friends came to, to our aid and like, he took everything down and was like, I'm so sorry, dude, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then from there I was like, wow, you know, that's such, but like now I feel like I really want to do music again because like, I feel like I got robbed. Mm -hmm. And then that's where Sync With Me started. Hell and then yeah. now here we are four years later after the fact. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Uh, we got it all in one go there. Normally, was, <laughs> normally people need some help getting through that. But that was <laughs> an incredible, succinct summary from start to beginning. Uh, or start to end, rather. Uh, I'm laughing that, uh, going back to the beginning there, that uh, Bring Me the Horizon was my band that I first heard and was like, yo, this stinks. <laughs> and then it just <laughs> kept listening. It would kind of pop into my head like, oh, what was that song that stunk? And you kind of keep going back to it. And then somehow this thing grows on you. Uh, and I think that's always an interesting moment of like, uh, you have to both like the music and also take on this identity that you like something that is weird. And I think that's a defining characteristic for a lot of our scenes that we've accepted that the thing we like is not in sync. It's not Britney Spears. It's not like the cool mainstream thing. And I guess that's 20 years past mainstream at this point. <laughs> uh, but like, yeah, it's not whatever the, the trendy thing is now. It's not Taylor Swift. It's not Olivia Rodrigo, right? Like we, we are in this niche community. And I think that allows a lot of us some freedom where it's like, instead of being the weird kid. It's like, no, 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 we're just in this thing. And now we're a normal kid in this smaller community. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting part of being 16 and getting into this is that leap of like, yeah, letting yourself be the weird kid and accepting. It's like, yeah, I don't really like NSYNC anymore. I'm, I'm in this weird pond that everyone else tells me is screaming music. That's weird. But it's like, no, I like this. There's something here for me. Um, and yeah, that comfort that comes with that, I think is interesting. And then to have that grow into, I think starting vocals in your basement is a really like a, uh, I don't know. It's a good exercise for life of like, just do it on your own and then the thing will come and practice will come. And that kind of practice makes perfect idea comes to mind of like, yeah, there wasn't any, any praise in it. There wasn't any pr uh, glamor in practicing your basement and along the songs that you've heard, but like it's rewarding. And it was important for you at the time. And uh, I don't know, a healthy way to explore this thing further before you're ready to do it. Uh, but I think that's the part of the journey that a lot of us forget about. It's like, you didn't just start a band. There was months and years in a basement and singing along to your favorite songs going, Maybe this will work at some point. Uh, and I think it's interesting that like you get into the band, you try and like make it work. It doesn't. And then as you kick your hands up and go, ah, fuck this, that's when it almost starts to work again. And I think that's an interesting piece of like, yeah, you can't force this thing. You just kind of have to let it happen and keep working at it and it'll happen on its own. And, and I, th I think that holds true for like a lot of bands and mm -hmm. a lot of individuals that like, you know, granted, there are people out there that like their very first thing is just the thing that takes off. Sure. It, it really is. Um, but for others, you know, it's all stepping stones to yep. whatever that next piece is supposed to be, you know, mm -hmm. like, I don't think that I'd be the individual I am or would have, um, or that sync with me would be what it was if I didn't mm -hmm. go through the other bands and the other experiences or, you know, like you said, like started in my basement. Mm -hmm. Cause like, um, I was just doing that and then like uploading it to youtube and i'd maybe get a comment here and there that was like yo that's sick. yo you suck don't do this yo unupload that <laughs> you know uh i know i feel like uh how much do the comments like influence what you put out and i think it's always a tough thing that i try and be aware of of like i don't want to be ignorant to the feedback right it feels dumb to get comments on something and not acknowledge them and not read them to a degree but it's also like i can't let those people be the ones who determine my output here like i don't believe that the people leaving a comment are a good representation of most people. Uh, so it's this weird thing of like, I can't, when someone says my band stinks, I can't not take that in. Right? I'd be 
uh, it'd be really hard headed and ignorant to assume that everyone who thinks my band is dumb is wrong. Right. Like I, at some point, if people say it, I have to go maybe, but also it's like, I can't let them determine the future of my band or my future, my project. I can't let them assess this music video that I worked hard on. Uh, but it sounds like as you look back that the comments really did kind of affect your path here and hold weight in your head of what did and didn't work. Um, for, for the most part, it, I didn't get like a ton of hate. Mm -hmm. It was more so just on that one Sleeping With Sirens sure, video. Yeah. And like totally understandably, like I look back, if I saw that, <laughs> I would have said, turn this off too, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I think that it's... I think it's good for character to at least acknowledge those comments mm -hmm. and to take them in. Cause obviously there's always going to be people that try and like tear you down just to tear you down because they're unhappy with whatever they have going on in their mm -hmm. life. And they feel better about themselves going, you suck. Stop doing this. If I and bring everyone else down to my level, exactly. Then I'm equal. And, yeah. um, you know, there, there are things that people have brought up. Like, so for one, uh, actually something that sync with me took into, um, took into our picture was a lot of the comments we were getting was that our mixes were just like, they could be way better. Like they were very muddy or like you, they couldn't hear anything. Um, so going forward, like after we put out our low spirits EP, when we put out our two singles, innocence and this isn't home, we like really drive home um, to our producer at the time. You know, we really want these mixes to be clean. Like we want everything to be audibly heard. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want it to sound all jumbled up and, messy and muddy and we got really good feedback from that people were like wow these mixes are great like better step in the right direction mm -hmm. um overall i think you do need to stay true to what it is you want to do and yeah. what your what you feel you need to put out in the world for your art um but you're only hurting yourself by not at least taking a look at those critiques those comments mm -hmm. not all of them are right some people are downright wrong you know yeah um but it doesn't hurt to look and go, you know, maybe we could do something, you know, a little different. Oh, maybe, you know, maybe the mix could be better. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, and where does it the, so I guess that's also where the like photo video content starts coming in as you're filming your own vocal covers. Uh, where does that thing start becoming outsourced when you start doing that for other people? <sighs> so um, if I were, if I were to go back to when I started, so I never got into photo video back when I like started uh doing like the vocal covers and stuff. I was okay. just using my mom's camcorder uh, and the, I didn't have like a tripod. So like I had to like, and it was one of the like thin flimsy ones. So mm -hmm. I had to set that thing up and like put books in front, yep. try and keep it up. I was doing guitar um, covers on my MacBook Pro. So same thing <laughs> of get, getting the angle and then angling the monitors and the front cameras, right? Yeah, yeah, same thing. And um, so I was just doing that. But um, actually how I got into photography and videography was... Um, my old band, we were getting a photo shoot done um, by my friend Emily, and she was showing me some cool in-camera tricks that she was doing, like with like water on the lens and like all this stuff with car lights. And I was blown away. For me, mm -hmm. I had not like I've seen creative photos and stuff, but I've never seen it in person. And like it, I don't know what was different about seeing it firsthand, but I yeah. was just I was like, wow, this is so sick. Like I wish I had gotten into photography. And she. She said, like, right then and there, it's like, do you want to? I have another camera and a lens. I'll just let you borrow it, you know, see if you like it. That's cool. And so Good I went, I, I, yes, if it weren't for her, I might not have made the jump mm -hmm. um, and would not be where I am right now. So shout out, Emily. Shout out. Um, so I went home with my camera and I took pictures of, like, my cat. And um, the, actually one of the most uh, notable pictures I remember taking was of cookies on a cookie tray. And I was like, damn, this photo's fire, bro. <laughs> yes, I could yep. I could crush this. Yep. And so uh, that week I went out, bought my own camera, bought my own lens, and um, just started going to shows, uh, taking pictures, and um, kind of just like kept doing it and doing it. And then every time I came back, you know, how can I improve that? Mm -hmm. You know, what were could I do in better? a band at this point? Like, were you playing shows or were you just going um, as a fan? I was just going as a fan. Oh, I don't yeah. believe... I was really active or the band, the band I was in was active, but we just mm -hmm. like weren't, I, I wasn't as active with photography as I am now because I sure. also was working my full-time tree job. So like it was kind of just something on the weekends. Like I was going to like our local mm -hmm. venue, the bungalow and taking pictures there. Classic little, little hole in the wall there. Yeah. I missed that place. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. I'm always interested. Yeah. It seems like uh, photo video goes so well, like, 
if I was in a local band, if I was starting a local band today, I would also get a camera. And every time my local band played a show, I would also take photos of the other bands who play. Because it seems like a, a cheat code to me of like getting in and uh, getting your name out and getting your local band on more shows. Like it, it's an easy way to get yourself invited and make people aware of you. Be kind to start relationships with other people. Like it seems like an easy way. And I think a lot of touring photographers have gotten in similarly of like they were in a band and said, well, if I'm going to be on the road all year. I might as well try this thing. And turns out that bands don't always, or yeah, bands can run into issues where the camera then can bail them out and become a plan B then when that doesn't work out. Uh, so I'm always interested in how these two kind of start and coexist. And then uh, where does the graphic design come in then? It seems like a third element that I think, yeah, third element they do really well. And it seems like there's so many pieces to this. But yeah, where does that one get introduced? So that gets introduced, um, I want to say... The for it, it was during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just like at home, bored. I had Lightroom and um, Apollo, our bassist, mm -hmm. was uh, like, you know, sending stuff that he was doing on Photoshop. And it's, it's really funny to think back, you know, almost four years ago where me and him were at, like in oh, graphic yeah. design and to where we're at now. Cause like now he designs for like Fit for a King, Gideon, all these crazy artists all That's the time. Sick. He's done designs for Wu Tang Clan. That's cool. Like, um, but I, I just remember, I was like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. Like I'll download Photoshop and I'll try. Mm -hmm. And I remember just like making designs and like, I'd look at it and be like, this sucks. I got to figure out how to do better. Yep. And just like, that was pretty much the mantra. Just like I would keep doing stuff. And then like, you know, someone asked like, Hey, can you do album artwork? Yeah, I can do album artwork. And then mm -hmm. go on and just keep trying and trying and trying. Cause yeah. I, I used to be scared to take on stuff that I didn't feel comfortable with. Or I was like, oh, I don't know how I do that. But now I feel more confident in myself as a creative um, mm -hmm. to accept those and be like, yeah, I can crush that. And then I just now I'm learning a new skill set, you know, something I didn't know how to do before. Now it's in my yeah. wheelhouse. Now my next project that might not involve that, I can take a little bit from that, put it to that. And it's that's always such a scary leap or it was such a scary leap to me to figure out how to be like, yes, I will do that. I don't know how to do it now, but I'm gambling that between now and then I will learn how to do it, incorporate it and make it work. And you're right. That is such a big step in confidence of like going from, oh, I can't do that to like, ah, I've figured stuff out before. And this seems figure out a bowl. There's enough YouTube tutorials that are close enough to the ballpark that I'll, yeah, kind of take a little piece here, a you, little piece there. YouTube tutorials are your best friend. Absolutely. Straight YouTube University. Up. <laughs> Anytime I come across something that I, that I cannot figure out myself, yep. YouTube and type in my very, very, very specific problem. Mm -hmm. There's a tutorial for always, it. Always, always <laughs> something. Uh, do you have any like formal training in all the softwares with camera stuff? Has it all been YouTube or have you taken lessons, classes? Yeah. Anything like that? Um, the, I took a graphic design class in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, admittedly I was not very good at it then. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really pay attention all that much. <laughs> um, that's what you do in a graphic design class. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't, I don't believe I've had any like super formal training. Mm -hmm. Um, there are people that have helped me at shows and like, uh, like, um, Ian Urquhart mm -hmm. went at one of my very first shows that I was shooting. I remember I was very nervous to, to approach him and be like, Hey, do you, do you have any tips? Like this is, you know, my yep. first time shooting and he explained, like, you know, gave me a quick rundown of like the ISO, uh, aperture mm -hmm. shutter speed and like, you know, the, where he's shooting at and just kind of like, you know, how he uses his flash to bounce and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, from that night, like that helped push me in like such a, a, or pushed me to that like next level, you know? Yep. And um, that I would say that's pretty much the extent of my training is having people like Ian um, to bounce off of and, you know, ask like, hey, how do you, how are you doing this? Or, hey, can you explain this to me? And uh, uh, I guess my follow up question there is, do you wish you had formal training? So I'm like you, where I, I went through YouTube University, I've done it all self taught. And yeah, I've had people who are kind along the way and supported and answer questions. But, uh, I think that's still pretty independent learning because you still had to approach Ian and say, hey, Ian, what's good here? And <laughs> Ian was kind enough to help you. But like, yeah, it's still on you to digest that and retain that. And Ian didn't follow up with you every week from there saying, so did you learn? Like, yeah. You know, hey, did you complete your homework? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I was still very much on Evan. Uh, and so I think it's interesting there for myself. It's like I, I think what I've learned on the fly from YouTube, from being at shows is more valuable than what I would have learned in a classroom. Uh, in talking to people in, on this show mostly, the one thing I wonder about with art school uh, is people get really good at taking feedback. So most people describe it as you described your graphic design experience of like, I was there, I did the assignments, but I didn't really take much from it. Um, but they always say that like we got really good at submitting my art and then someone being kind of a dick about it and saying, nope. 
not good enough. And here's 10 reasons why. And you have to get really good at ingesting that feedback and regurgitating it out where I think that's not a strength of mine. I think like I'm good at working with revisions and notes, but it's like, I don't know. I think what I make is still sacred to me. And I'm not really comfortable with someone coming in with pri pliers and like dissecting this thing and ripping it all apart. Uh, and I think if I had gone to art school, maybe that'd be more comfortable for me and maybe that would like encourage more growth. Right. And I don't think uh, it's growth I could never make without art school, but it's one of those things that I go back and it's like, oh, it's a fundamentally different road than the one I'm on. Uh, from your sense, like, is there any part of you that wishes there was an art school or formal photo school background? Or are you happy with YouTube University? Does that feel like a better road for you? Uh, I would say, yeah, it's a better road for me. Because um, personally, I never did well in school. Yeah. Uh, I just don't think... Um, I thrived too much in school. Mm -hmm. I have just like too much going on in the head. Like I want to, you know, do my thing. Yeah. And um, I guess that's what I love about, you know, being my own boss and mm -hmm. being f a full-time freelancer is yep. I get to do everything I want the way I want it. Um, and then if there's anything I don't know, I can at my leisure when I want to learn it. Right. Because I felt like school, um, at least for me, it was just very like um, – draining in yeah. a sense having to sit there because it's almost like and i guess i'm a better hands-on learner too mm -hmm. versus like someone just explaining information to me like sure if, and, or unless if you were explaining it and i'm doing it at the same time then mm -hmm. it's like even better um but as far as school i think i think learning the way i have is the way i would i would continue to do it yeah yeah, I always go back and forth there. I don't think there's a, a right answer. And of course, I, I'll never change what I'm on and what's it worth, right? Like, I think if I really wanted to, I'd go back to school now. So I guess the fact that I never have <laughs> says, says more than anything. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you. Where it's like a classroom doesn't seem like a great place, but there's always a, yeah, I don't know. You would learn something. Like, there's, there's I, a reason I, mean, I think exist. one of the, yeah. the big things that you would learn, like you were just saying, would be that um, being able to process feedback better, mm -hmm. you know, because not everyone can handle feedback or criticism and that's totally yeah. okay you know not yeah. um like because like you said you know some people pour their whole heart into something and they're like yeah this is perfect there's nothing wrong someone's like mm -hmm. well <laughs> let me tell you you know yeah. um because yeah. I, I remember i remember vividly i will not drop their name but you know they hit me up and asked me for to be like um to give them an honest uh, feedback on their song. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, absolutely, dude. Like, I'd love to. Like, I love doing that for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I do it for the No I Seen Boys all the time. Uh, Caleb will hit me up and because he, he knows I'll be honest with him about the song. Like, hey, I don't like this. Or, hey, this is sweet, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but this guy hit me up and was like, hey, can you check out this song and, like, give me your honest feedback? And I was like, absolutely, dude. So I checked the song out and I gave him some honest feedback. I was just like, hey, this sounds really good. Um but whoever is singing, I like. I would potentially ask whoever's mixing it to maybe retune some of these parts. Maybe like you know fix some of the vocals. They sound out. Feedback. They sound out of pitch. Yep. You know. And he was like, "Yeah, you sound like you use a lot of auto tune. Do you?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> I was like, "That's so uncalled for. Like yeah. you, you came to me, you yeah. messaged me, and were like, hey, can you give me yep. feedback? Because apparently you valued my feedback on it. And then when it wasn't like." whoa, mm -hmm. you guys are amazing. It was like, no, fuck you. Yep. Like, you use auto-tune. You can't sing this and that. I was like, okay. That's, so, yeah. Sounds so fantastic. Petty. That's someone who's looking for feedback, and the only feedback they're willing to accept is, is A+. Plus. Exactly. But, yeah. like, how do you how do you grow as an individual if they're, yeah. like, everything we do isn't going to be perfect, and it's not even necessarily in the sense that it's um, bad. Yep. It's just that, like, there's always room for improvement. Always. It doesn't matter who you are. Yep. Like, you can always improve. You can always increase your uh, your skills and your your tool belt, all of it. Yeah. And, it, and that's kind of what I live by. Like, I don't think that I'm at the, like, there's just still so much more for me to reach for and to learn. Always, and that's yep. what I want to keep doing all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it took a while for me to separate that. Like, you can hate something I made, but that doesn't mean you hate me. And it took me a while to like separate these two things. Uh, and yeah, last week I had chain twist on, uh, and then we had, we talked through a video process that had a lot of revisions in it. Uh, and it was one that really forced me to be like, this isn't about making the best video for Peter. It's about making the best video for this release. Uh, and I think that was the heart of our conversation was accepting like, yeah, what is the best thing for this project? Cause it's not necessarily the first idea that comes to either of our brains. The best thing is when we all put our heads together and go, what if, what if, what if? And then we kind of triangulate these three things and end up with this project. Uh, and I think for me, that's become the most fun part is like helping bring that perfect thing out of someone's head and figure out what that thing is and kind of 
I don't know, I almost look at it like sculpting where it's like, I just come with a big brick marble and my job or a big brick of marble. Uh, and my job is just chip away all the bullshit, all the bad ideas. And so we're left with just this thing of good ideas that we're happy to show off and present to the world. Uh, and I think it's, yeah, really fun to talk through people and yeah, the collaborative nature, I think of that process is really exciting to me. Yeah. And, and that's also one of the reasons you would go to someone else, mm -hmm. uh, in any sense to work on a project for you yeah. is to have that added expertise, that added input. Mm -hmm. Um, cause if you just wanted it, like, you know, it exactly your way, you should just do it yourself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I've had, I've had a couple of issues with, uh, some revision stuff like that. And it's like, it's, it's hard because, um, you know, some of the stuff, like it is their video, it's what they want, but like trying to explain to them, like, this doesn't make sense though. Like mm -hmm. visually, this does not make sense. We shouldn't yep. do this. And then again, yeah. but it's not my video. <laughs> like it's my work, but it's their video, but it's also a representation of my work. Yep. So it's like, it's a... Yeah. And it's a weird place to draw the line. I'm laughing. Uh, there is one, uh, there's two videos that come to mind here. Uh, there's one upcoming that I can't quite chat about, uh, but two in the past that stand out to me. Uh, one, there's a half hearted video I did for insatiable recently. It was a song with uh, like a Bonnie and Clyde love story and performance scenes. Uh, and there's a version one, the version that came out was like version two. And there's a version one there that we all loved and we talked about it and it just like, it had, couldn't come out for a couple of reasons and we had to change it. Uh, but it's one of those that look back and it's like, you get the feedback of like, Oh, you did great on that. And in my head, it's like, thanks. But like, if only you had seen like the one, one that we had to water down. And it's, uh, it's always this, yeah, kind of fun challenge for me of like, yeah, it, you force yourself to get better because what's put out is never, I don't know. It's always growing and changing. I think there's a, I don't know, a transient nature, I guess, these videos. Uh, and the other one that comes to mind is, um, a vomit fourth video I did. And there's this one shot in the middle. That's like, it's a really like fast and like chaotic video. And there's one shot in the middle. That's like seven seconds long, which is the longest shot by a mile in the whole video. Like nothing else is close to even half a second, I think. Uh, and I remember we like, it, we went back and forth for a while in these like seven seconds of like three of us being like, it has to be there. It grounds the whole video. It's the only way that this thing isn't a clusterfuck. And the other camp was like, no, we want the clusterfuck. Make it crazy. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> so it was it. these weird conversations you get into of like, well, what is best? What do I like? And then what is best for this thing? What do they like? And how do we bring all these three together? And in both cases, you know, the videos came out and to my knowledge, everyone's happy with them and we got good feedback on all of them. Uh, but yeah, it is a really kind of gnarly process there. Uh, is there one that stands out? I'm not asking you to name Jeff anything, but is there something that stands out at the time where you fell in love with the video and got feedback that changed that idea? Like, how do you, I guess, how do you cope in that moment of you get the email back and you go, fuck, I'll do it because you're the client and sure, but nah, I don't agree with you. Like, yeah. What is that moment like? Yeah. I, I don't want to name drop them. Of course. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it definitely. Of course, please it, also then don't describe the video. Yeah, to uh, I'm like, not going yeah, go to describe there. anything about it. Please, yeah, um, yeah. Because yeah. they're they're good dudes. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, they're just young. They're, it's yeah. a young band. Yep. Um, but you know, I we did the video and like I gave them a first cut that I thought was mm -hmm. really good and like made sense and like some of their ideas that we did film didn't end up visually looking the way that like I would put out like this is my work like, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I you know explained to him like hey like these shots didn't work um you know check out this and yep. I, I thought it was a really good cut like uh I was very very proud of it and then six revisions later of mm -hmm. re-adding all of the stuff that like they wanted in it and yep. then um that that was the hardest part because I I did I yeah. did try it not not necessarily fight with them but more so kind of be like, guys, like, you know, it really shouldn't have these in it. Like from like a, n not even just cause I'm the one doing it just from like, if I were to watch this, none of this makes sense. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah. I had it at the end we, I just, you know, we, we agreed to give them what they wanted and they were happy with it. So like at the end of the day, that's really all that matters that, you know, they were stoked on it and yeah. on the, the finished product. I've, yeah. What I've generally learned in those situations is that my best outcome here is to have a relationship in the future. Like there's nothing I'm working on right now that I'm willing to be like, no, it's going to be my way. Fuck you. You know, like it's just, <laughs> it's the best case scenario here is like, yeah, make them happy and let's grow and let's work together in the future because we're all just trying to go forward here. And if we get stuck working on this video, like, I don't know if it's a $500 video, it's a thousand, even if it's a $2,000 video, like in the context of 10 years from now, who cares about any of that amount of money? Like we're either going to be successful and have 
enough money that these don't matter or this whole thing will have blown up and those money doesn't matter anyway because we've all kind of fallen off. So, uh, yeah, to me, it's like it's in the long game here. And in these times where, yeah, there's these headaches that you got to solve with the client, it's like yeah, in the short term, I want to win the battle, but just focus on the long term, focus on just making people happy and move forward with that. Um, I want to touch on the self-employed part of this. So you mentioned that, yeah, if you want to do it yourself, then do it yourself. Uh, And I think that's something that we've both got in common. There is this desire or this attitude of like, fuck it. I'll just do it. I don't need someone to do this for me. I'll just put my own two hands on it. Uh, What's that process been like for you to be self-employed? I assume you're working from home also in that process. Like, yeah, what has that year journey been like for you? So when it, when it first started, it was, it was scary. Mm -hmm. It was very new. You know, I've been employed since high school, yeah. you know, I've uh, always worked full time, mm-hmm. um, always had a steady paycheck, you know, um, even throughout the entire pandemic, you yep. know, I, my job was state stayed intact. Um, so it was, it was very different to go from that to then now having all this freedom. And, mm-hmm. um, for me being like a dad of three, it's super awesome. Mm-hmm. I get to spend so much time with my girls at home and I get to see my wife all the time. Um, so those things were, were super awesome. The hard part was my very first December. The first slow month. <laughs> a, uh, yes, my, my very first slow month. I am not kidding when I say I think I made $20. It, mm. it was, I, that whole month, I, I remember thinking to myself, beating myself up every day going, did I make a mistake? Yep. Did, like, did I leave the comfort of a paycheck to pursue something that maybe I'm not good enough to actually do? You know, and I had all these doubts and all of these um, insecurities about, you know, everything I was doing, everything I I made during that month. I was just like, it's not good enough. It's not. Mm -hmm. Flash forward, January 5th, busiest week I ever had. Literally, I had everyone hitting me up for, for graphics, for photos, for video, whatever it was. And from that January up until now has just been nonstop busy, you know, um, so I, there, it, it's, it's awesome that, you know, working for yourself is amazing. You don't have to answer anyone. You, you don't have to go somewhere you hate for eight hours a day. I get to make my own schedule, yep. uh, work on things on my time. Um, but there is also the, the added <laughs> stress and pressure of like, oh, no, uh, it's been two weeks and no yep. one's hit me up for anything. I, I don't even have any, like, people hitting me up just for quotes. Mm-hmm. Uh, rent's due in two weeks. What am I going to do? Yep. You know? Um, my, my first, uh, I went self-employed in January of 2020. So you can imagine <laughs> how that quickly changed. Where oh to that point, God. I've been doing this for three or four years, and I was making part-time money where it was like, I think if I put my full year into this, that I can get close enough to a reasonable income that I can make this work. But it was like, I, I wasn't making a living yet. It was just like, I think if I have twice as much time as I do now, then I could make a living with this. Uh and yeah, it was two months of things going pretty well for a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, the world stopped. And I think those moments really do force you to check yourself. And for me, it was a similar, uh, yeah, the same fear of like, not just, yeah, I, I can't work. And then what? Now I've quit this thing. Do I have to then swallow my pride and go back to this thing that I left? And that's not the worst thing in the world, I guess, you know, to some, to some point that has to happen. But it seemed like such a big loss to my pride of like, I worked so hard to build the momentum to get here. And now the world's going to shut down and I'm going to just go back like, fuck that. Uh, and so, yeah, for me, it was a process of going, staying inside, I guess, almost of going inside myself, but I guess staying inside myself and just learning more. And that's where the, the 3D stuff came from. That's where Blender and Unreal Engine and figuring out 3D graphics of like, well, if I want to make music videos and I can't go do it outside, then where, how, how is this thing going to work? Uh, and thankfully that thing came together uh, and I ended up, uh, so in March, the world shuts down, I believe in April or May, somewhere in there, like two months after, uh, I get hit up to do a 3D video uh, with Fever 333. Uh, so it was the same thing as you said of like, there was just this calm and you kind of go inside and say, this isn't working, fuck everything, but I'm going to buckle down and try and figure this thing out. Uh, and those ebbs and flows are, I think, so characteristic of what we do of like, yeah, the calm before the storm is just a, a dumb saying, right? It's so cliche and tacky, but there is a real truth to it for us of like, yeah, things come and they go. And it's about finding that average and being comfortable in both situations. And I think that's also tough for me where I think when things are on the upswing, it's like, oh, I'm God. Money's going to come forever. I'm never going to be poor again. And then <laughs> inevitably it does dry up. And, and it's like, like, oh, no, oh I'm it? never going to make money again. I'm going to be poor forever. And it's, yeah, trying to find comfort in both of those of like when things are good, it's like, 
yeah, yeah, but they're going to go back and that's okay too. And then when they're bad, it's like, okay, but they will change. It's not like, yeah, it's a real tough thing to get comfortable with. And I think being self-employed, yeah, it's a real unique challenge of like, yep, there's no backup here. Like it's, it's going to work or it's not. And it's on you to figure it out. That is it. You know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, I feel like if I ever wanted to, which I don't, Mm -hmm. if I did want to go back to tree work, I could, because you know, it it is an industry that is always going to be always going to be there. They're always going to be hiring. Um, they just don't pay enough. You know, it's also very dangerous work. So I do, I do like the, the comfort of my safe job. And I'm sure my kids and my wife (laughs) appreciate it too. (laughs) Probably. Yeah. And I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure your kids will idolize you regardless of what you do. I think that's a, yeah, they'll support you bringing home to put food on the table, whatever, whatever mean that looks like. Um, but yeah, I think it's an incredible thing. I think doing with the family is an additional challenge where I mean, I've got me and my cat to, to take care of responsible or be responsible for. Uh, so yeah, I think doing it with the weight of a family or the, yeah, the challenge of keeping a family stable and happy and healthy is a whole new layer to this. That I didn't even quite thought of for you. Um, so that's incredible. Uh, has it all gone well? You since since those since that December of the slow month, I think is uh, industry built on disposable income. December is a tough time for us, uh, but since then has it gone well. Have you figured out strategies looking ahead to this next December? Is it about just saving up and living off savings for December? Have you figured out new ways to get business in the door for December? Well, so funny enough, the the thing that's kind of supplemented a lot of my income, um, aside from the photos and videos, is graphic design, which. Yeah. Um, I, through working with a couple of people, have kind of been, I'm like just their go-to guy. Mm-hmm. So like whenever they need something, I'm able to just like That's whip awesome. it up like that. Um, and then I, I cut them a deal mm-hmm. uh, for, you know, what I'm providing them. So for, for the most part, I think this year I'll be a lot better off uh, come December. That's good. I also have planned like a gig or two already mm-hmm. that like cover my bills yeah, for yeah, that yeah. month. So it's yeah. like... I'm not going to be in the red. I'm not going to be like in a hole. I have things figured out for this year. And um, obviously I'm a little bit more headstrong this year, having gone through where I was like texting my boss, like, (laughs) yo, you you still need a trimmer to now I'm here doing what I'm doing, you know? So uh, very excited for this this year. Uh, Last year, not so much. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's part of the growth. And I think, yeah, I I try and keep in mind that those ups and flows will still come. So there will still be times where I'm shocked at how well things are going and I'm still going to be bummed out at how bad things are going. And yeah, they're both guaranteed at this point and both are in their own way exciting. And I think that the, I think they're both really important. I think when they are going well, it's important to soak it in and say, oh yeah, I am good at this. There is a value in what I'm doing. And I think when they're bad, I, I almost relish the idea of like, Oh, they don't believe in me. Watch this. Watch what I'm going to do now. Uh, and I think both of those are important pieces of me to like stay in touch with, I guess. And as the universe kind of dictates, that I have to go between the two states and be flexible and accountable for both halves of myself there. Um, uh, I had a segue out of that. I'm totally drawn a blank on what it was. Um, but that's okay. Um, oh, well. Uh, green screen stuff. Uh, I wanted to chat. Uh, this is something I've been thinking about recently that's kind of unrelated to I guess, where we've been. Uh, but I've had the idea that I should never film anything that's not green screen ever again. Uh, and I don't think that's totally true. Obviously, it's extreme and not totally fun. Uh, but my thinking here is like whatever we film in practically, whatever warehouse we film in, we could make it digitally. And if we make it digitally, we can make it better. And that's true of any venue if we're filming yeah, whatever, insert location for a music video. Uh, and I think it strips, I think the flip side there is that the green screen strips a lot of like the organic magic out of what we do and a lot of the fun of being on set. Uh, it's rare that I get to pick someone else's brain. I feel like I'm really picking the band's brain about this. And for you as a director, I'm curious, like, where do you stand on this thing as the industry moves forward and it does get more digital and green screens more accessible and computers are more powerful? Like, is that a tempting place for you to go or is there too much magic in person that you're not willing to sacrifice? I think I, so I, I haven't had too much experience with green screen yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, funny enough, me and Apollo have been talking because Apollo has been diving into Blender and learning 3D and yep. he's been creating some pretty crazy stuff. So I was like, mm-hmm. dude, let's start doing some 3D videos together. Yep. Um, so I'm not totally opposed to it, but I do think that, that like you just said, there is a certain magic mm-hmm. to shooting it like, like at the set, at the location. But the caveat of that is, say you really wanted to film this video in a gothic uh romanian castle sure you, you're, are you gonna fly the whole band to romania to you know film in a castle no mm-hmm. you could do the green screen yep. and, and get it exactly the way you wanted it the yeah. lighting exactly the way you wanted it so i think um 
I think they're both very good uh, options to, to pursue, whether it be doing it practically or subbing it out for the green screen. If I'm playing devil's advocate here, I always wonder if like if the magic of being on set is real. Like we feel it and the band feels it and I think in our memory bank it's valuable. But in the final product, I I'm not convinced that it translates to screen. I think we feel it and because we're the directors like the way I see my videos is so different than anyone else, right? Like there's an intimate tie where as I watch my video, I remember being in the room filming. I remember what I was wearing. I remember the people, how I felt, what I was eating and drinking. Like there's so much loaded into our videos from our perspective that no one else will ever absorb. Uh, and like when I put out, uh, I did a half-hearted video for Voodoo and there's these CG scenes of us like up on a forest, up in a mountain. Uh, and everyone, I got a couple comments of like, that was incredible. How did you hike up there and do it? And it was like, we did it. We did it in Jay's basement and then we made it fake and blender and we did it. Uh, but it was like, oh, as they watched this, they had the magic. They had, as they watched it, they had the mental image of us carrying a drum set up a mountain and waiting for sunset and then me walking to the mountain next door to film from <laughs> like, you know, like it's, it's un like to me as a director, Jesus, uh, to me as a director, it's like, it's unbelievable that the magic is contained in that. Cause like I made that and I, I literally dragged each of the trees around to where I wanted them in the frame. Like it's so artificial but if someone watching it still had the magic of us walking the mountain, then the magic's still there. And it's this strange thing. It's a dilemma to me of like, ah, it's it's uh, unattractive reality to go so much to green screen. But it's harder and harder to me to argue against it and to argue in favor of the Romanian castle. Um, and I don't know. I'm always curious of, yeah, where other directors stand. And I think it's rare that we get to pick each other's brain about things like that. Yeah, I, I think I would like to dive more into green screen. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be really fun, like you were just saying, being able to build the sets exactly the way you want it. Yeah. And I mean, to build it well enough that someone w thought you hiked a mountain <laughs> yeah. and brought the drums up there and everything yeah. else, you know? I think it's also like, I've found that even the green screen stuff, as as cool as it is in video, I feel like it makes life so much better when I walk into the, the castle, let's use that example or run with that example. When I walk, walk into the castle in real life, I've wandered through so many castles digitally at this point or set settings of it digitally. And in 3d, of course I can change the camera, right? So I can go full frame crop sensor I can go fish. I can go all the way to the biggest zoom lens. I can play with all these things, all the, yeah, I can fly a drone. I can fly my gimbal. I can go on the ground. I can go underground. Like there's this unlimited op opportunity with the camera that I think then when I arrive on the, the real life version of the castle, it's like, Oh, I've already explored so many places that I'm way more comfortable going, hey, I want a 35 millimeter and I want it from up there. And I don't know what that looks like yet, but because I've done this in practice, I've done it digitally, I can do it. And I think that's been the most valuable part of 3D is like being more confident on set because I have this experience that isn't real, but it is the same thing. I mean, it's, it is real yeah. in a sense, you know, you are building a, a digital landscape and then you're testing that that yeah. lighting that camera that all, angle all, all of it yep. you know yep. and being able to 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 take that and transfer it to a real life set going mm -hmm. like oh i've worked in a room like this before i know that if i put lighting over here and i yep. have my angle here this is the the this is going to be the outcome this yep. is what i'm going to get and this is what i want yep yeah yeah it's a fun one and i think even then it's like if we have the warehouse set up there's been times where i've built the warehouse digitally to send to the band and say, hey, this is what we're gonna do. And then we show up, there's no question about what's gonna happen because it's something's already done. And it takes so much of the weight off of the filming day of like, yeah, here's what the video is gonna be. Now we just have to go do the thing, but there's no questions left to solve. And it's a yeah, unique freedom that's an interesting one to me, but it, it also means that I'm not on set. It means that filming on set is boring and stressful and it's about math and getting the lighting ratios right. And then the editing process, instead of being this fun process of going through footage, it's compositing green screen and dragging in, you know, PNGs and mats. And it's like, I don't know, it's this dilemma that I just can't, uh, can't seem to progress past in my brain um, or find a good answer. And probably there is no good answer. Probably you're right that there is a, a time and a place for both. Um, but I guess for the sake of argument, it's a fun road to go down to me and to figure out, yeah, what, what makes sense here. Um, and I don't know if there's an answer there. Uh, I wanted to touch on, we're coming up on our hour here, actually. Hell yeah. This has flown past us here. Um, I feel like it's only been like 15 minutes. Perfect. That's either really good or really bad. So let's hope it's good. Let's let's hope it's really good. <laughs> uh, no, we're doing great. Uh, I have two last little things here. Uh, both are kind of random little pieces. Uh, one is the Live Nation merch thing. So I assume you saw this last night, mm -hmm. this morning, uh, that Live Nation announced a big merch cut. Uh, and I want to touch on it because I thought it was an interesting 
I don't know, merch cuts have been in the news for a while, it seems like, or in our little circle of news, they've been in there for a while. Uh, this was interesting. Uh, the verbiage that comes out is that Live Nation is announcing uh, nationwide merch cuts. Uh, what is actually happening is that there's 77 venues across the country that are uh, having merch cut. I think it's through the end of the year, so it's mm -hmm. three months. Uh, and then there's the stipend going out for gas money to artists, uh, which I think is all cool. I think my in my cynical brain to me, it's like, Live Nation isn't supporting artists. Live Nation's making money. Live Nation is pleasing their investors. How does this please their investors? Because it seems like they're just giving money. Uh, and come to find out that it's like, yeah, exactly what they're doing is pleasing their investors because now there's, one, so much good press for Live Nation that nationwide they're cutting merch. And it's like, well, not really. There's only one venue in Connecticut and one venue in Massachusetts that doesn't have a merch cut. Like, it's not that big of a, uh, a reach here that we're impacting. Uh, and I guess, yeah, for those people, it is big, but it's like, uh, I don't know, it's a really interesting thing of like marketing and copywriting of like, they're getting this publicity of like, they're saints. And it's like, eh, for a couple months, they're doing good for some people. But the other ripple of this is that it makes it really hard to be an independent venue. That's not a Live Nation venue, right? If you are going to, to the Boston area, you're going to go to MG, I think it's uh, House of Blues, sorry, is the one that's relevant here. It's like, you're going to go to House of Blues because there's no merch cut. Like the independent venue in Boston now has a way harder time drawing talent. And that also increases the Live Nation stock of like, it makes them even more desirable. And I don't know. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Do you have any sense of the merch cut thing or yeah, where do you kind of stand on it? Uh, so I, I guess where I stand on it is that the, there is kind of, you know, the, the, um, the inherent like, well, why are they doing it? Mm -hmm. Like they're not doing this out of the kindness of their hearts, yes. you know? Um, but at the same time, uh, I think the best way to look at it is it's just like, it's the, it may not be like the biggest step forward in the right direction, but it is a step 100%. like that they were even willing to, because at the end of the day, they don't have to like, look at live nation, look at the amount of venues they own, like how much money they make. Like there's no, like that's a drop in the bucket for them. If a hundred people say, Oh, I'm mm -hmm. not going anymore. Their venues, they're going to go, well, okay. 10,000 more people yeah. who have no idea what merch cuts are, are still going to come to our shows. Yeah. So I think it's more so we need to, you know, acknowledge it and be like, hell yeah, this is awesome. Let's keep it up. And then if anything, I think that with them being one of the biggest um, concert contractors that have these venues, if anything, it's going to drive those independent venues mm -hmm to get rid of their merch cut yeah. because now, you know, all of these venues are going to see, you know, the 77 venues that live nation has that are, um, I'm, I'm assuming Expected, yeah. testing it out, um, through the end of the year are going to see how well they're doing. Now everyone wants to book with them. Everyone wants to put their shows there. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, okay. Well, we're going to get rid of our merch cuts too. Now they're going to go, well now, you know, and they're going to, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, whether or not how fast it takes that, you know, maybe merch cuts get, um, phased out would be pretty cool. I don't think that any venue should be taking any cut of any band's merch. Um, Without to, giving them a cut of the bar, I think is the important caveat. That, that there. should it's be like it. We both get a cut or we don't, neither but, one of us gets a I cut. But I mean, they wouldn't yeah. want to give you a cut of, of the course. bar because yeah. the bar is making four times, five times what you're making at the merch table. It's yeah. literally just like you're already not making money on the road. Yeah. You know? Yep. Um, and, and funny enough, on this topic, I just saw uh, on my before I left this morning to come here, I saw a tweet from Ryan Kirby. Okay, yep. um, oh, they just played a Live Nation venue mm -hmm. and got the $1,500 yes. um, stipend yeah. and um, how that's going to help them out because yeah. like they were able to take 600 of that, fill all their buses and like get going and like yep. they still got money left over to go yeah. towards that. So I think that's really awesome. And they didn't have a merch cut, you know? I think you're um, right. I think also the, the awareness part is you're right. Probably the, the part I hadn't thought about that is the most important part is that it makes other people at least talk about it. Or even if it's, I think, I, I think the number I saw was it's 77 venues out of 4,000 possible venues. So it's like, yeah, it is a drop in the pond, but it is a very big drop or at least a conversation started it, exactly. for other people to yeah, explore the idea or be open to it. Cause again, I, I'll, I'll always circle back to, they don't have to do that. Yeah. People like, and it's the unfortunate thing that's, you know, they are the primary concert host. They have these venues. Like that's what, uh, that their corporation is. They don't have to do this, but they're trying it. So I think it's really yeah. cool, uh, in the sense that they are doing it. Like, obviously the, like, you know, 77 venues, it's not a lot. There should be way more, but 
it, you know, they are trying something, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they're, they're just testing it at these venues. Like maybe these venues are their most profitable. So they're testing it out there and seeing like, you know, yeah. how is this going to affect us if we get rid of the merch cuts and like start, you know, helping them out a little bit more, you mm -hmm. know? Cause like, I feel like people also tend to, especially in today's day and age, take anything, um, yeah. not with like so much as a grain of salt, but more of like, uh, no, that's not enough. You're not doing enough. Yeah. You need to be doing more than that. Where instead it should be like, that's awesome. I'm really glad you're doing that. Let's see where this goes. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I think that that should be the way that we should be handling things like that. That like, like we should applaud them. Like, yes, this is what we want. Thank mm -hmm. you. We are going to support you even more now because you're doing what we want. They pull back from that, then pull that support back. You don't like, you know, like you gotta, you gotta keep getting those inches before you get the mile. Yeah. Yeah. I think or to get those feet before you get the mile. <laughs> inches is a long time. Uh, it all adds up though. I think, and I, I guess I hope that feet is the correct, the correct analogy or foot, there. Foot. Uh, or, the footses. The footses of the, the miles. <laughs> Close enough, dude. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I wonder It like, it doesn't, I, I think I refuse to believe that live nations altruistic here. Uh, and I think if it all goes to benefit them, I don't know. I think that I'm trying to like pick my words here and I don't quite know what I'm trying to say, which makes it hard to pick the words to say that thing. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I'm very, I'm fascinated to see how it plays out and I hope it's a longer term thing than what they are pitching. Uh, and I'm also curious to know where that money comes from uh, because if they're spending whatever it is, 1500 bucks a night isn't huge, right? Right. You assume and taking money, but like, that is an amount of money that they have to recoup in some capacity. And it seems like this is a partnership. I think it's Willie Nelson mm -hmm. is the person they're partnering with. My assumption is that it's, he is a charity that is also like matching money. And my assumption would be that because his name uh, is I would assume so. He, he is very for the musician. Of course. Uh, and so that also is like, a, yeah, will other people follow steam or yeah. Where does this money get recouped? Where do they increase costs to make this more justifiable? Um, I don't know. I'm very curious to see how it plays out. And I think I'm, uh, very skeptical of it. I'm glad to hear that you're a little I, more excited or I'm, optimistic by it. I, I'm a little skeptical, of course, you, you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. A, yeah. as anyone should be yeah. because you know, it is, it is only through the end of the year. They might not ever, you know, go, yeah. they might go right back to merge cuts and, and no yeah. gas money, no, none of that. Or you might hear um, that merge cuts at the other venues are up by 5% or something. Yeah, my yeah. yeah. Or <laughs> yeah. It, it could be any of those, but I yeah. do think that it, there is still some good that could come from it potentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we'll, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, wait you know, and see. wait, yeah. see where we're at, uh, come January. Uh, my, my last little thought here, and this is a completely random thing. That'll be a 30 second conversation. I think, uh, as I was going to bed last night, I like to get read through Reddit and that's my kind of source of news. Uh, and one thing source of news, I guess is I should qualify that statement is like, I know Reddit <laughs> isn't a good source of news, uh, but it's my place for like celebrity gossip and reading through. And, uh, last oh, of night course, of course. I was reading out Michael Jordan, uh, and his gambling addiction. And he was very known for, as a gambler. And, uh, he was known to, yeah be gambling huge sums of money at all times on golf on dice back you know before the game not that not that we're aware of on games themselves but just hundreds of thousands of dollars just constantly changing hands over anything he could bet on uh, and it struck me as this uh this idea that like that's why he's so good in the clutch and the pressure of this big moment is like because he lived his whole life under that pressure and it struck me that like that his greatest weakness of this gambling vice which is the thing that he's most criticized for, to my knowledge, or like the thing that is most easily you could point to him and be like, ah, that's, that's not great. That's not a thing you maybe should be doing all the time, but it's like, that's the thing that made him great in game seven, you know, in the game seven of the whatever. And it struck me as like, so his greatest weakness there is also his greatest strength. And as I, it was an interesting thought of like, what is my strength and is it also a weakness? And how do these things to balance out? And for me, it's like, I work too hard. I know for me, like I, no one I will work until it is done. Like I have no qualms in thinking that like I'll work beyond the point where I should stop and I'll keep going until I believe it's done. And that comes at the cost of my own well being sometimes, right? Like it's, it comes at the cost of sleep or food or exercise, fitness, a balanced lifestyle. Uh, and it was kind of this interesting look into, into the mirror of like, yeah, how do these two things balance out? And is it worth being Michael Jordan if you also have this enormous gambling vice? Uh, and I just wanted to throw it out there as a, as a, as a word for, I guess, people listening for artists. And I think for all of us, we're, we're self-employed, right? We are, we make, uh, we are successful by being somewhat crazy and somewhat outside of the norm, but it's important to me to like qualify that and be aware of where this thing could fall off the rails. And it's like, yeah, just because that I'm great at that, does that mean there's a cost somewhere that I'm not seeing? Um, 
And that's my 30 second rant on Michael Jordan gambling. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it's a tough thing to be an artist. And also, I, I think I joke that artists are like broken by nature. Like it's, it's what makes good things come out. It's what makes, it's why we have good ideas or why we have ideas that are outside the norm is because we're putting in ingredients that are different than other people are putting in. Um, and I guess just being, trying, yeah, being aware of the balance there of like, yeah, where's the downside to that? Where is this thing? How do, where does the best person come out of me instead of just the best artist? Um, and I don't know that answer, but that's a thought I had to get out of my head today. Um, mission accomplished. <laughs> uh, an hour, nine minutes, Evan Middleton, episode 39. Uh, vocals in sync with me, graphic design, photo, video. I know we got tour coming up. Yeah. What has happened in the life of Evan? What are we interested in? Uh, anything to plug before we head on up out of here? Uh, I would just like to give another quick shout out to Cult Fiction, who recently endorsed Sync With Me. And Hell I'm yeah. rocking their, their hat right here. Hell yeah. Uh, other than that, I just want to thank you very much for having me on to, to talk about music and uh, the things I'm very passionate about. Absolutely. Dude. Thanks for making the hip trip down. I appreciate you. Yeah, it's always rare. I think I uh, rarely get to chat with people who also do what I do. And I really appreciate the chance to pick your brain. And I think, yeah, hopefully we can make each other better and we can all get better and make this whole whole world a little better. I think the show here is something from everyone. Uh, and the idea is exactly that. Like, I, I just want to learn from more people and I'm excited to get to learn from you today. So I appreciate you coming down. Appreciate you taking the time, and we'll see you soon. We'll talk soon. Hell yeah. Hell yeah.